Section 36 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ricarda Detmold, Germany. The American Book of the Dog, G. O. Shields, Editor, Section 36. The Great Dane, German Dogger by professor j h h manner the noblest of all the canine race is undoubtedly the german dogger generally called great dane in this country and england he possesses all the good qualities by which the large breeds are distinguished and surpasses all others in vivacity gracefulness of movement elegance of form and imposing size the symmetry of his limbs his proud carriage his beautifully shaped head supported proudly by a long finely arched perfectly moulded neck his bright eye the eloquent index of intelligence fidelity and courage his deep broad chest and long muscular legs indicating swiftness and fortitude the short glossy coat displaying his magnificent muscular frame all parts are so admirably and harmoniously combined as to render him the most perfect specimen of the canine race affectionate strongly attached to his owner and especially fond of children he is a brave faithful friend ever ready if necessary to risk even his life in defence of his master's person or property this breed has been known by various names in different countries and at different times viz ulmer dogge great dane boarhound fanghund altdeutsche dogge etc such a variety of appellations naturally caused much confusion and misunderstanding the german dog fanciers therefore met during the band show at berlin in eighteen eighty adopted a standard of points and agreed to drop the difference between the heavy and light strains and to call the breed deutsche german dogge previously the germans had usually called the breed ulmer dogge after the city of ulm in württemberg germany because the breeders in württemberg had been most successful in their endeavours to improve the dogge and raise him to such perfection that the fanciers in other parts of germany soon vied with them and now the germans call the german dogge with just pride their national dog while the great dane according to the gartenlaube of april eighteen eighty five has gone to the dogs in denmark on the title page of the book die deutsche dogge published in july eighteen eighty eight we read as follows we have used in the english translation the term the german dogge in preference to that of great dane the name the breed has in england because we consider that the fatherland of the dogge the country in which they have been brought to their present state of perfection has the right to choose the name which it considers correct the great danish dog danske hunde is an entirely different breed which is found in denmark and the points of which were fixed at the exhibition in copenhagen eighteen eighty six the illustrierte zeitung of february five eighteen eighty seven contains a picture three kindred races of dogs the english mastiff the danish dog and the german dogge and the following remarks the danish dog little known in germany is unquestionably closely related to the english mastiff but it has better legs and feet than the thoroughbred mastiff and is faster livelier and not so clumsy the best specimens are said to have been raised thirty or forty years ago on an estate called broholm and are therefore also called broholmer dogs the danish or broholm dog does not at all resemble our german dogge as may be readily seen from our illustration and it is proof of ignorance if many a fancier still classifies our german dogge as danish or ulmer dogge the distinction appears to have been invented by dealers for now we find the light than the heavy strain mentioned as danish or ulmer dogge during the great international exhibition of dogs of all races at hamburg in the year eighteen seventy six 
it was evident that none of the breeders and connoisseurs present were able to classify and distinguish the numerous entries as ulmer or danish dogges during the following shows at hanover eighteen seventy nine and berlin it was resolved to abolish this unwarranted distinction entirely and to designate the breed as german dogges which they have been in reality for the last three centuries at the same time a standard of points was agreed upon after the best specimens according to them the german dogge must neither be too heavy nor too light but must keep exactly the medium between the greyhound and the molossus dog later attempts to have a heavier kind acknowledged besides the one recognized by the standard have always been rejected with overwhelming majority by the friends and breeders of this finest and largest of all canine races the origin and descent of the german dogge are not definitely known but we do know that the breed is of great antiquity in the agricultural forest and hunting laws of the old german tribes which were not collected until the middle of the tenth century under the title geoponica seven kinds of dogs are enumerated in the lex alimanorum of these the canis porcaritius boarhound that catches the swine or the canis ursa ritius bear catcher that catches the bear the cow or the bull and the veltris leporalis the greyhound or harehound are thought to be the progenitors of the german dogge that probably owes his origin to the efforts made to raise a breed in which the principal qualities of the above-mentioned varieties that is strength and fleetness are combined a savage strong and courageous dog whose origin is a mystery existed in ancient times in the book the varieties of dogs as they are found in old sculptures pictures engravings and books by thomas charles burgeau we find pictures copied from the british museum of this dog the canis molossus now extinct bearing a striking resemblance to the german dogge aristotle mentions the canis moloticus after molossus or molossia the central part of epirus in ancient greece three hundred fifty years before christ in his historia animalium the canis venaticus hunting dog mentioned in marcus terentius varro's work de re rustica in the last century before christ is probably the same dog as the canis moloticus or molossus as well as the canis venaticus that junius moderatus calumella writes of in the first century of the christian era shortly before that time gracious Faliscus, in his synecdetican treats of the manner of using the dogs for hunting of raising and training them of their qualities diseases etc also apianos of anasarbos in the second century in his didactic poem de venatione marcus aurelius olympius nemesianus of carthage in his synegetican and titus julius calpurnius of sicily in his synegetican sen de re venetica eclogae describe explicitly the qualities of the dogs and their being employed for hunting many other historians and poets among whom virgil horace caius plinius secundus living shortly before or in the beginning of the christian era describe and extol the canis molossus and his valorous deeds the romans are said to have become acquainted with these dogs in england and to have exported many of them for the purpose of using them in the circus to fight with wild beasts three of them could overpower a bear and four even a lion the romans finding extreme delight in these contests valued the pugnacious molossus dogs whose daring exploits historians and poets extolled so highly that they appointed officers in their british provinces whose business was the selection and training of the dogs to be sent to rome long after the decline of the roman empire these dogs were employed for such bloody contests and when bears and lions became scarce the bull was substituted for them john stowe describes a contest between three of these dogs and a lion in the presence of james i one of the dogs being put into the den 
was soon disabled by the lion the second met with a similar fate but the third immediately seized the lion by the lip and held him for a long time till being considerably torn by the lion's claws he was obliged to quit his hold the lion greatly exhausted by the conflict refused to renew the engagement but taking a sudden leap over the dogs fled into the interior part of his den two of the dogs soon died of their wounds the last survived and was taken care of by the king's son who said he that has fought with the king of beasts shall never fight with an inferior creature the dogs however were not the antagonists of wild beasts only they or their descendants were also trained to attack persons during the conquest of cuba and san domingo in fifteen eleven the spaniards under diego velasquez employed the dogs in subduing the natives and pursuing them into the forests where they had sought refuge horrible deeds are recorded of the famous dog baricillo that was killed by an indian with a poisoned arrow during the conquest of puerto rico in fifteen fourteen a descendant of baricillo vasco nunez de balboa's dog leoncico was also famous for killing and tearing to pieces numbers of indians in fifteen nineteen the spaniards under hernando cortes employed these dogs in the same cruel manner to hunt down and kill the natives of mexico during the reign of charles the great in the eighth century the canis molossus is mentioned and in the forest laws of king henry the second of england of the twelfth century we read of the canis mastivus many varieties are the descendants of the canis molossus the most popular of which are the bulldog his diminutive relative the pug the english mastiff and the german dogge in pictures painted by celebrated artists in the beginning of the sixteenth century notable among which are the wild boar hunt by jürgen jakobsch the bear hunt by francis snyders the wild boar hunt by peter paul rubens we find a species of dogs of the same size and shape as the present german dogge these dogs also enjoyed high favour with the german nobility and were the constant companions of their noble masters famous dogs of this kind were owned by the emperor wenzel charles v and the duke ulrich of württemberg the latter when dispossessed of his throne by his enemies in the beginning of the sixteenth century had to seek refuge in the caves near the castle of Liechtenstein for some months where principally through the sagacity vigilance and courage of his dog he escaped several murderous assaults made against his life there are at present three varieties of the german dogge viz the brindled or tiger striped the spotted or harlequin commonly called tiger doggen in germany and those of one colour while a distinction should be strictly maintained with regard to colour no difference is to be made in size coat or form it must be admitted however that those of one colour sometimes have finer hair lighter forms and a more pointed head whereby some are induced to believe that there is more greyhound blood in them others are of the opinion that the fawn or the red variety descended from the brindled dogge by a disappearance of the dark streaks and also the black one by an increase of the dark stripes and that the grey or blue one was produced by crossing the fawn or the sandy red and the black dogge the origin of neither the spotted nor the brindles being known their colour is to be considered original it is supposed that the spotted variety received his wall eye and spotted or flesh-coloured nose by a crossing of albinos with black dogges which theory is plausible since a similar colouring of the eyes and noses of the progeny from spotted and white horses is observed the spotted specimens have white silver-grey or bluish ground colour with irregular black grey or blue spots or patches those with white ground colour and black spots are the most beautiful the lighter the ground colour and the darker the spots the better 
some persons entertained the mistaken idea that these dogs were used for hunting or attacking tigers because they are generally called tiger doggen in germany in france the whole coloured variety especially the blue or black is preferred also of late the tiger as well as the brindled dogger finds admirers there at the exhibition at paris in eighteen eighty nine charles goutet's tiger bitch calypso his tiger dog roland the second and his brindled dog fidelio won first prizes these dogs are very large and their receiving the highest honors at an exhibition in france while the smaller elegantly shaped dog has always been valued highest indicates a modification of taste in that country where specimens over thirty inches high were not much thought of fidelio one of the finest specimens known is a powerful dog of strong bone about thirty-four inches high weighing one hundred and eighty-three pounds he is much admired in france now though the brindled dogger is called there by many a butcher dog in england it is entirely different there the tiger and the brindled varieties rank highest great size is highly appreciated there and mr riego sit campeador a dog of about the same height as fidelio is much admired the admirers of the large specimens will even overlook a little dewlap which is more frequently found on those over thirty-one inches high than on smaller ones besides we find many very large doggers with coarse hair and a faulty frame the yellow dun dogge with black mask is generally considered the result of a cross with the mastiff in england while in germany the black mask is a desirable feature preventing the appearance of red or flesh-coloured noses in puppies brindles will often whelp yellow or dun puppies with black masks which fact proves the erroneousness of the above-mentioned supposition another erroneous opinion prevailing in england is that dew claws indicate a cross with the smooth-coated st bernard they are not an ornament or a desirable appendage but are found on the specimens of the purest strains sometimes they are cumbersome and hurtful they may grow into the flesh or the dog may be wounded by them in another manner therefore it is advisable to relieve the puppies of them with a pair of sharp scissors when about two weeks old or even sooner the operation will cause little pain and the loss of blood will be slight at so early an age in germany all varieties have their admirers but the preference is generally given to the brindles first-class specimens of that variety were scarce at the exhibition at cannstatt in eighteen eighty nine because they are in such demand that few of them remain in württemberg for a long time the german breeders endeavour to raise large specimens but those not possessing a correct frame or being deficient in bone muscle or otherwise are but slightly valued with reference to the size of dogges we often find exaggerated statements but it may be safely asserted that the german dogge is superior to all other breeds in height mr riego declares his champion sit campeador bred in germany to be the largest dog ever raised in europe his height being thirty-four inches at shoulder and that the largest st bernard measures about thirty-three and one-half inches but that his owner makes him thirty-six inches according to the jagd und schutzenzeitung of april fifteenth eighteen eighty nine the height of the german dogge victor then exhibited at chicago is thirty-eight inches the wittenberger kreisblatt stated some years ago that friedrichs caesar was one point zero two meters or about forty and one-sixth inches high the latter assertions have to be taken cum grano salis not many dogs will attain a height of thirty-four inches and few of those exceeding it will have a correct frame actual measurements of Boppelt's Schandor, one of the largest and finest dogges taken not long ago may be of interest length of head twelve and one-eighth inches length of neck eleven and three-quarter inches length from neck to set on of tail thirty-two inches length of tail twenty-five and one-quarter inches 
girth of skull twenty three inches girth of chest thirty eight and three quarter inches girth of loin twenty eight and seven eighths inches girth of thigh ten and one quarter inches height thirty four and one eighth inches the above measurements were taken and guaranteed correct by mr siebert shandor is young and not fully developed yet the ears of the german dogge are generally cropped because it gives the head a bolder and livelier expression and appearance in england however a stronger position prevails against the cropping of the ears of any breed and the wish of the queen of england as well as the exertions made by the society for the prevention of cruelty to animals to put a stop to this so-called cruelty may be of no little consequence the queen of württemberg who visited the exhibition at cannstatt in eighteen eighty nine expressed also a wish when admiring the class of beautiful german doggers that the ears might be left to them just as god created them the french on the contrary do not want a dogger with uncropped ears and a german sporting paper the hundesport remarked not long ago there is danger that america will follow the example of england we in germany do not crop the ears of our hatzrüde since the day before yesterday our ancestors did so centuries ago and if it will be admissible to draw a general conclusion from a greek coin the cropping of ears was customary two thousand years ago and neither england nor america will alter it the same paper had in its issue of january twenty second eighteen ninety the following we have been informed that in two cases owners of young doggers were indicted by societies and fined for cropping the ears of dogs should any one of our readers be fined on that account he is requested to enter protest against it and to ask us to name him two experts who are ready to declare under oath that the non-cropping of ears was the cause of continual suffering in the ears so that the cropping had to be performed in advanced age not the cropping of the ears is tormenting but their remaining uncropped we are convinced that on such evidence the parties indicted will be acquitted on the other hand experts spoke and wrote against the fashion of cropping ears professor weiss of the veterinary college at stuttgart says in his book the dog his qualities breeding and treatment in healthy and sick condition the operation of cropping ears consists in a tormenting for the sake of satisfying a nonsensical taste besides according to the opinion of the greatest dog fanciers the dog looks in his natural condition much better than after squandering any cruel art on him moreover the consequences of this useless mutilation do not cease when the ear is healed the irritation caused by it often has an injurious effect on the internal ear and frequently deafness is the result not a few dog fanciers affirm that the exterior ear of the dog being movable prevents the free entrance of insects dust rain snow hail etc protects against the changes of temperature assists the animal in catching the sound waves and thereby renders the sense of hearing more acute thus we see that the opinions of experts as well as of fanciers differ and are even diametrically opposite with reference to the cropping of ears the taste for cropping however is predominant and we may predict a continuance of the fashion in spite of arguments and protests footnote i wish to record here a most earnest and emphatic protest against cropping docking or otherwise mutilating dogs of any breed in my judgment these practices are cruel and useless and the taste or notion that fosters them is erroneous editor End of footnote. standard of points the great dane club of england whose object is the breeding and improvement of the german dogge has adopted the following standard of points which is a few unessential differences excepted the same as the one laid down by the breeders in germany general appearance the great dane is not so heavy and massive as the mastiff nor should he too nearly approach the greyhound type 
remarkable in size and very muscular strongly though elegantly built movements easy and graceful head and neck carried high the tail carried horizontally with the back or slightly upward with a slight curl at the extremity the minimum height and weight of dogs should be thirty inches and one hundred and twenty pounds of bitches twenty eight inches and one hundred pounds anything below this shall be debarred from competition points general appearance three condition three activity five height thirteen head long the frontal bone of the forehead slightly raised and very little indentation between the eyes skull not too broad muscle broad and strong and blunt at the point cheek muscles well developed nose large bridge well arched lips in front perpendicularly blunted not hanging too much over the sides though with well-defined folds at the angle of the mouth the lower jaw slightly projecting about a sixteenth of an inch according to german standard the lower jaw must be neither projecting nor receding so as to make the teeth meet evenly eye small round with sharp expression and deeply set ears very small and greyhound-like in carriage when uncropped they are however usually cropped points fifteen neck rather long very strong and muscular well arched without dewlap or loose skin about the throat the junction of head and neck strongly pronounced points five chest not too broad and very deep in the brisket points eight back not too long or short loins arched and falling in a beautiful line to the insertion of the tail points eight tail reaching to the hock strong at the root and ending fine with a slight curve when excited it becomes more curved but in no case should curve over the back points four belly well drawn up points four four quarters shoulders set sloping elbows well under neither turned inward nor outward leg forearm muscular and with great development of bone the whole leg strong and quite straight points ten hindquarters muscular thighs and second thigh long and strong as in the greyhound and hocks well let down and turning neither in nor out points ten feet large and round neither turned inward nor outward toes well arched and closed nails very strong and curved points eight hair very short hard and dense and not much longer on the under parts of the tail points four color and markings the recognized colors are the various shades of gray commonly termed blue red black or pure white or white with patches of the before-mentioned colors the colors are sometimes accompanied with markings of a darker tint about the eyes and muzzle and with a line of the same tint called a trace along the course of the spine the above ground colors also appear in the brindles and also the ground colors of the mottled specimens in the whole colored specimens the china or wall eye but rarely appears and the nose more or less approaches black according to the prevailing tint of the dog and the eyes vary in color also the mottled specimens have irregular patches or clouds upon the above named ground colors in some instances the clouds or markings being of two or more tints with the mottled specimens the wall or china eye is not uncommon and the nose is often parti-colored or wholly flesh-colored faults too heavy a head too highly arched frontal bone and deep stop or indentation between the eyes large ears and hanging flat to the face short neck full dewlap too narrow or too broad a chest sunken or hollow or quite straight back 
bent forelegs, overbent fetlocks, twisted feet, spreading toes, too heavy or too much bent or too highly carried tail, all with a brush underneath, weak hind quarters, and a general want of muscle. The diseases peculiar to this race are the same as those of other large smooth-coated dogs, and are generally the consequence of overfeeding and want of exercise, or of not being properly protected against dampness or the inclemencies of the weather. The doggers are very hardy and easily acclimated. They can live in a cold climate and better than rough-coated breeds in warm countries. If properly fed and cared for, they will rarely be sick. The best food for them is broth, milk, vegetables, cornmeal, boiled or baked, meat, cooked or raw, and bones. The Future of the German Dogger in the United States An enthusiastic admirer wrote not long since, Make room for the Great Dane, for he is coming. And it is no wonder that he is coming. The more generally his noble qualities, his superiority to other breeds are known, the more rapidly will the number of his friends and admirers increase. It is strange that this variety is comparatively little known here yet, and that not many years ago there were not enough in this country to have a class for them in the shows. In New York they were first exhibited in 1886, when there were eleven of them. In 1887 only six were exhibited. In 1888, seven. In 1889, seventeen. And this year, 1890, twenty-five. In Chicago, there were fifty-three exhibited at the Mascuta Kennel Club show this year. The Great Dane or German Mastiff Club of that city, organized last year for the purpose of popularizing this breed, has now a large membership and has already done and will doubtless do a great deal to call the attention of dog fanciers to the german dogger the efforts of the members of that club will certainly be appreciated by those who may acquire a specimen of this breed and thus become acquainted with the beauty and admirable disposition of the dogger it is however difficult to get the best specimens and they command high prices for importations we must rely principally on germany the home of the breed in a review of the remarkable events in the dogdom of germany during the year eighteen eighty nine a german sporting paper prints the following foreign countries carried off several doggers two went to mr riego in england mr underwater in holland got diana essig and professor manner in baltimore bought bravo pluto and minca mia to the kennel of monsieur goutet in france went fidelio libusa roland and rheinperle thus we see that few specimens worthy of being mentioned left germany last year but a greater number will surely leave during this year and thereafter as illustrating the noble disposition of the german dogger i quote some extracts from a communication to the american field one in the issue of september fourteenth eighteen eighty nine from baltimore signed wisp reads as follows the recent importation of several fine specimens of the great dane by a gentleman of the city has created more than a passing interest in this noble breed of dogs i was attracted to this breed a few years ago by witnessing a most remarkable case of transition of temperament that is from a playful mood to one of intense earnestness and courage i was walking along a suburban road and saw ahead of me two little children crawling and climbing all over a large fallow-coloured supple-looking dog that seemed to enjoy the romp as much as the children it was an engaging picture and the more i looked the more interested i became in the kind of dog for when i first looked i thought what an athletic built mastiff that is yet on closer observation i knew it could not be the ordinary english mastiff for his head was not so broad and was carried more proudly on a longer neck and higher and the way he jumped over those children and stood aside 
grandly erect a moment to allow them to look up in his eyes and try to pull themselves over his back was a position i never knew an english mastiff to assume while debating in my mind what kind of a strain breed or type of dog it was i suddenly heard a growl the dog positioned himself firmly where he was standing about quarter way across the road threw his head up curved his neck and looked a very vulcan of courage immobility and defiance as he gazed up the road the children meantime had rushed up to him clinging around his neck and foreshoulders the scene was worthy the brush of well i doubt if there ever lived an artist capable of transferring that life picture to canvas the cause of all the commotion was the sudden appearance of two tramps who had a large vicious-looking specimen of a feist dog with them talk about indians stealthily stealing by the foe the way those tramps and their dogs slid to the extreme farther side of the road and scooted by in the most abject terror double discounted them the protector of the children never moving a foot the while his head only turning in line with the tramps and a low roar issuing from his mouth when the tramps leaped over a side fence and disappeared then the children fairly hugged and caressed the dog whose position indicative of every nerve on tension was instantly changed to one of let's continue our romp proving to me that such a thought as fear never entered his mind i determined to learn what breed of dog it was and to become the owner of one i entered the garden walk to my right and soon ascertained that the dog was a great dane and that five hundred dollars wouldn't buy him from his owner if offered i have since become the owner of a very good specimen of the breed and while it does not score quite as high as the recent importations still it possesses every merit and characteristic of the breed of great danes and nothing could induce me to again own an english mastiff while it is possible to own a great dane the following by mr riego honorable secretary of the great dane club of england referring to the above appeared in an english sporting paper on november the second eighteen eighty nine i have read with interest a letter in the american field of the fourteenth ultimo signed wisp and headed great danes versus mastiffs without entering into comparative merits of the two breeds both of which i have kept i will at once proceed to confirm the generous character and sagacity of the great dane as evinced by the following cases among others which have come under my notice one of my relatives a farmer in spain owned a mill some three miles from town and it was the miller's practice to call daily for the wheat which was conveyed on mules to the mill long after nightfall to ensure the miller against possible attack by depredators one of the house guards a great dane without apparently any training would take upon himself to accompany the miller and his cargo to the mill and the dog would retrace his steps home as soon as he saw the miller safe at his destination another relative who also kept a great dane finding his favorite pear tree lightened of its fruit gave the dog free access to his orchard with the result that next morning an unsuspected neighbor was found lying on his back at the foot of the tree the dog standing over him and defying him to move hand or foot but the man was still unhurt in a letter to the american field published january four eighteen ninety the writer of this article narrates the following a dog fancier in the city who had a pair of german doggers many years ago and lost them has had st bernard's for several years but brought a german dogger not long ago and intends to dispose of his st bernard's because he knows the qualities of the different kinds and prefers the german dogge to any other large breed another dog fancier in the city who kept newfoundlands for many years bought a german dogge last spring and is so well pleased that he gave his newfoundlands away and does not want any other breed as long as he can get a german dogge this dog when bought was not quite a year old and was soon admitted into the house where he became the playmate of his master's only son of about the same age 
one evening when they had been playing together a long while the dog lay down to take a nap during which the little fellow disturbed him by pinching him and pulling out some of his hair whereupon the dog awoke and growled fiercely the terrified mother saw the dog look around and the animal recognizing his little playmate as the disturber of his slumber licked the child's hand last summer i engaged a young man to attend to my dogs who made friends with them very soon and was permitted by his wards to go about everywhere and handle everything on the place and in the house but when he wanted to go into the cellar after he had been with me for a week he was stopped by the dogs and not allowed to move until i came and told them to let him go down now he has the privilege of the cellar too another communication signed e g chicago illinois appeared in the american field of february first eighteen ninety it is headed great dane intelligence and reads as follows as this noble breed is daily assuming greater prominence the following narrative of fact may be found of some slight interest several months since the writer owned a st bernard puppy which had survived a very severe attack of distemper only to be stricken by paralysis and was sent to a veterinary hospital for treatment the canine warden of the establishment a young great dane called jumbo showed a deep interest in the new patient apparently comprehending his helpless condition and believing that it called for his special protection when prince moaned in pain jumbo would at once rush to his stall and regard him with the utmost sympathy and concern nor would he permit any person save the veterinarian to approach the sufferer on one occasion during jumbo's temporary absence a stable boy in changing prince's bedding was obliged to disturb him thereby causing a howl of distress instantly there was a responsive thud of flying feet along the hospital aisle and jumbo was upon the terrified boy like a fiend the vigorous use of a pitchfork alone prevented serious bodily damage shortly afterward my wife and daughter called to see the patient and proceeding directly to his bed were welcomed with joyful whines jumbo's vigilant ear caught the sound and believing it heralded his charge's distress flew furious to the scene seeing him pass the stableman who had received orders to confine the dog when strangers were present were terribly alarmed and the veterinarian who had just entered turned sick with apprehension their fears were groundless reaching prince's bed jumbo's vengeful aspect gave place to an expression of pleasure as he comprehended the situation at a glance and knew his ward was in the hands of friends to the end which came too speedily his vigilant care continued and we learned that every suffering animal received at the hospital became at once the object of jumbo's protection not long since a gentleman related that a friend of his and the latter's neighbors living in the country in the state of new york had been troubled by tramps but that this annoyance ceased since his friend had become the possessor of a german dogger that is a menace to the tramps and a faithful protector of persons and property within a circuit of more than a mile a few months ago prince bismarck was met and caressed by four splendid specimens of german doggers when arriving with a train at his country seat friedrichsruhe one of them he received as a present from the emperor of germany shortly after his dog thuras known all over the german empire and beyond its limits as the reichshund had died of wounds received in the attempt to rescue property belonging to his master from a burning building at friedrichsruhe the news of the heroic death of the reichshund was telegraphed and cabled all over the civilized world and recorded by the newspapers who can doubt that this grand species of dog will soon be the gentleman's dog in this country as he has been in germany for centuries the dog of the student the high officer the nobleman the prince he accompanies his master while walking or riding in the carriage and follows with ease the cavalier on his fiery steed 
because of a mutual attachment the owner does not like to be without his handsome cleanly favorite and admits him into the parlor but if the doggo will be the favorite of the gentleman in america he will rise still higher in the estimation of the ladies and children where can they find a friend as faithful and firm where a protector as reliable courageous and at the same time as tractable as the german dogge even when aroused he is easily controlled especially in the country and in lonesome places this sagacious clever and powerful animal will be invaluable end of section thirty six recording by ricarda detmold germany